Welcome to Gen Zoomers Real Talk on Just About Anything. I'm Sharon. And I'm Julie. And we're best friends. Julie is a Gen Xer, I am a boomer. For those of you that are just joining us or have never seen the channel, the idea for this channel is to create a space of diverse woman voices. We want thought-provoking conversations. We want playful conversations. We really want to connect with other women, and so our intent here is to foster connections with women through subjects that we're interested in, which leads us to a real fun topic. Before we get started, cheers to you, Julie. Cheers. Ooh, nice big glass. Wow. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. That's just a prelude of what's to come. Our featured guest is a woman dynamo, to say the least. She is a winemaker and the owner of the Willful Wine Company. Willful is defined as determined, pertinacious, unruly, wild. And we think that just about sums up Pam Walden, <laughs> except we'd like to add grace to the definition. Blend these descriptives together and you have a woman to love. She's been a winemaker since 2000. She distributes all over the country. Her simple philosophy on how she got into the winemaking business translates to her winemaking style. Mm -hmm. But we'll let Pam tell you how she got into the business. Welcome, Pam. Cheers to you. Cheers. The wine is delicious, by the way. <laughs> oh, I, I, need, I need an extra. I need a refill. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. I poured a nice big glass, so... Oh, my goodness, yes. you are a well, woman okay, of many Okay, well, let's talents. get rolling here. Pam, how did you get into the winemaking biz? Um, I got into it by accident. Um, I, um, I married a chap, uh, Aaron Hess, and he was interested um, in making wine. That was kind of a passion of his. And uh, so he was interested in buying a property out in Dundee and getting grapes. And I just thought, well, that'd be a nice place to, you know, bring up kids. And sure, that sounds fine. Um, so uh, we started in 2000 with four barrels. Um, that was 97 cases and just kind of gradually built it up bit by bit while we each kept our day jobs. And um, I just got it up to about, at one point we were about 8,500 uh, 8, cases. Wow. Um, now I'm about 5,000, maybe just a fraction over 5,000 cases a year. All right. So describe your approach, your winemaking style. I've got two different brands and they both have a different um, style. So my Jezebel wines are fruitful and accessible, kind of earlier drinking wines. Um, and those I like to, they should have a really nice kind of um, primary fruit, um, be um, easily accessible, easily drink, drunk by themselves. Um, but then I need to be very well balanced um, uh, and interesting wines as well, not completely kind of one dimensional. And for those, my end point is the goal. So I have an idea of what I want to make stylistically. Um, and that's um, the end point. Um, then for my willful wines, those are a little more terroir driven. So terroir being um, the sense of place. Uh, Pinot Noir is, uh, is as a varietal, as a great varietal, is um, very expressive of where it's grown, um, especially in um, Oregon and the Willamette Valley. Um, it prefers a cooler, um, a longer growing season. And when you get that, you get this wonderful expression of um, fruit, of earthiness, of uh, floral aromas. I mean, you know, just it's, it's, it's a particularly expressive varietal. And I like to be able to uh, support that as much as possible because it's so expressive. So I use native fermentation. Um, I feel like native yeast um, in, um, support the fullest expression of the terroir. And I like a very feminine, elegant style of um, uh, Pinot Noir. And then I also make some other varietals as well. What do you consider key ingredients and stages of producing a great tasting wine? decisions it's like anything you, you make decisions all along the way i mean decide where you're going to get your grapes from um some vineyards are, are, are you know are just better than others um who's managing the vineyard will make a big impact you could have a site that's you know got fantastic terroir should give you really amazing grapes and yet if it's not being managed properly it's not going to reach its full potential um and then you can have a site that's being managed fantastically and it's just it's just kind of a marginal kind of site and it's only ever going to be ever you know so good i was thinking about this today actually um and uh, about you know because one of your questions is like what makes a good wine and uh, as first it's like an everyday wine 
And I was thinking, so it's like people, right? So you can kind of like, you know, buff up your body and you can kind of like put some lipstick on. You can look pretty good, right? But, you know, there's some people that's just like, they've just got like six foot legs, right? And like, you know, perfect boobs and everything. And they're just going to be, they're just going to be like that. And they can just walk, walk, wander out of the house and look perfect. Well, there's some vineyard sites like that, right? Um, <laughs> they just don't need to try too hard. Um, but then, you know, there's also this character development as well, right? So for vines, age is really important. Um, and uh, so as a vine ages, usually it gets much more interesting. So the roots um, go further down. Um, and as they go down through these different layers of uh, um, dirt underneath them, they, um, you get more, lay more layers of whatever's down there, basalt, whatever. Um, and then the other thing as well, as vines get older, they'll get a little bit more sort of balanced, more sort of kind of okay with themselves. Um, mm -hmm. And so they tend to be naturally balanced um, and just more expressive. So I like older vines particularly. Uh, but there's also some vineyards, like I said, they get older, but they don't necessarily get any better. And we know people like that, don't we? Yes, yes we, do. we do. We just but get better. Not though. us. No, not us. <laughs> no, we just not, get better. Better. not <laughs> us. No, not us. You know, I was curious because you hear so much about grapes, but really all grapes are not created equal. They're not. No. Nope. So some have super long legs and perfect tits and others just don't. <laughs> it's just reality. And, and that's it. And th there is probably uh, a preference for all types of people, you know, a preference for wine, just like, you know, all people. Exa <laughs> that is exactly it, you know? And so, you know, really the most important thing, you know, you were saying that what makes a good wine and what makes kind of, you know, an average wine. Well, it, do you like it? That is really the only question to be asked is, do you like it? And do you like it more or do you like it less? That's the only relevant question. You know, I've made wines before. I made, I made one wine one year, which has, it, had, it was flawed. It had a, this um, Britannomyces in it um, and it was kind of funky. And some people just really like that. It's got this kind of earthy barnyardy thing going on. That some people really like, I don't care for it so much. So, you know, I didn't keep a whole bunch for my personal consumption. I must say I like barnyard. Yeah. <laughs> huh? I do. I like earth. I like earthy. It's kind of like my teas. I like earthy. Are grapes like a well-bred racehorse? Yes, I would say, you know, you've got certain sites that are particularly well, obviously, you know, there's definitely some sites, you know, Dundee Hills, Eola Hills, there's certain regions that are particularly suited to um, certain types of grapes. Pinot Noir particularly works really well in the Willamette Valley because it's got this cooler growing season. Um, some soil types um, are particularly, give you certain flavors that um, generally are, I think are more pleasurable with Pinot Noir. So there's a couple of different soil types in particular that I enjoy. Um, but again, it's a preference. And then also you need to be warm enough. Um, so, you know, we don't grow Cabernet Sauvignon in the Willamette Valley. I mean, I'm sure somebody's got some planted somewhere, but there's not a bunch of it. It's not like for Southern Oregon, my Cabernet Sauvignon I get from Southern Oregon and from Walla Walla because we're just not warm enough to be able to make it right here. And then vineyard management has a lot, um, it really does impact a lot. I mean, um, you know, you take really good care of yourself, right? You're gonna look better. Well, same thing with vineyards. Um, if they're really well managed, you just get a much better product. I have um, a couple of vineyard sites, younger vineyard sites that I'm working with now, one in Ribbon Ridge and one in the Dundee Hills. They're both really well managed. The owners are really care about what they're doing and I really enjoy working with them as partners um, because of their attention to detail and how passionate they are about trying to make the best fruit possible. So how do I develop an educated palate or how does yeah. one develop one? I have to drink a lot. <laughs> It's okay. really hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That, okay, so I, I have an excuse to drink more because yes. I have an educated palate. <laughs> it's time to yeah. be educated. <laughs> I always advise people as well, um, you know, go wine tasting. If you are fortunate enough to live in a region where there are local wineries, go and explore. I mean, it's a, it's a fun thing to do. Ask questions. Find a local wine store. You know, don't go, you know, looking at sort of scores in magazines. Don't go, you know, to whatever. I mean, Costco is awesome. And they, certainly if you know what you want, go pick it out. Um, but find a local wine store 
um, and a wine steward that can get to know your palate and what you like and, and enjoy the education that they have, to, they have to offer. So those are my recommendations if you want to learn about wine. Yeah, and and you have point. fun while you do it. Yeah. You know? Okay, so, all right, there's collectors and then there's everyday consumption or consumer type. We go in and we buy a bottle of wine. I'm not a collector. I'm not one that sellers their wine. What's different from a collector than somebody who goes in and buys everyday wine? There are wines for different purposes. You know, I make two brands, two, two product lines because of that. My Jezebel wines, um, I create them with um, usually a little bit, maybe a little bit less acidity. I don't have quite so much silver when I go to bottle. I try to keep the tannins in the Pinot Noir um, very supple. Um, and um, bright um, and not particularly big um, so that they're wines that are, can be drunk early. Um, they're screw cap, so they're really easy. You can go take them on a picnic and take them to a party and they're wines where there's a nice core of fruit on the attack and it's um, wines that you can drink by themselves. You can put them with food if you want to, but they're pretty versatile and they're pretty, um, have pretty broad appeal. And then I have my willful wines. Like I said, there's a little more um, terroir driven there there's more structure to them as well. So I do a longer skin contact time and I'm making the wine. I will cold soak for a couple of weeks. The, I use native fermentations tend to be um, slower, cooler fermentations. Um, so you get more skin contact time. So you get more tannin, you get more flavor extracted during primary fermentation. I will hold the wines in barrel for longer. Um, and um, so I'm trying to get wines that have a little bit more structure. So more tannin, so more of that, you know, tannin is that kind of, a feeling that you get on your tongue uh, mm -hmm. so a bit more grip um try to make them so that as i try to source vineyards so that are going to give me a little more acidity as well so a little bit acidity is really important to cellaring if you want a wine to be able to um, age well it's really pretty key to be able to have some acidity in it so structure and acidity for wines that you want to age the backbone of the wine is going to give you um, the ability to for it to be able to develop over time um, so I adjust my wine making for depending on whether the wine's going to be drunk early or whether I'm hoping that it's going to age for a while. But you can still drink my Wolfel wines um, pretty much when they're released. They're just going to get better as they get older. There, it, it just sounds like your Wolfel wines are a better seller wine. Yeah, uh, for sure. That's what they're, okay. they're, they're made with that intention. You can drink them now, but you can also hold them. Whereas the Jezebel wines, I would, I mean, you can, and they may be fine, but it's not, that was not the purpose for them. It's not the intention. I bought this one today. It's oh, fabulous. Cool. Thank it's you. Fabulous. Okay. What I is just it? had to throw that in. Uh, I need my glasses. <laughs> oh, me too. I'm having to kind of stay away from the screen a little bit. <laughs> uh, oh, this is the temp. The Tampanillo. Mm -hmm. So Tampanillo from Delfina Vineyard, um, Southern Oregon, because it's not really quite warm enough to kind of get it fully ripe um, up here in the Willamette Valley. Um, that I fermented as 100% whole cluster. So I've had um, Tempranillo before from Spain, from Rioja. Is, um, it's where it's grown a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and um, as they age, I, found, I, I felt that sometimes there was a lot of tannin there um, and not, um, and the, the fruit kind of aged out, but the tannin was still there. And so I was trying to make a wine that was maybe, um, there was imbalance. And all the winemakers that I, you know, asked about, hey, you know, how do you make Tempranillo? Because of course in the Willamette Valley, everybody's um, really great about sharing information. And so I That's spoke nice. to some other um, winemakers in Oregon and uh, they said, yeah, it's got a lot of available tannin. So I thought, well, if I, if I ferment as a hundred percent whole cluster, so whole cluster means I don't take the grapes off of the stems. I, I, it's the whole cluster being fermented in the, um, in the fermenter bin. Uh -huh. And so I figured without breaking the skins, I should get a gentler extraction. Um, and then I also pressed off the wine. So you, you know, you let it percolate in there, you know, keep putting the grapes into, in, down into the juice and extract all the good flavors and tannins. And then it gets down to being uh, where most of the uh, sugar is turned into alcohol and then you press it off. Instead of letting it get completely dry, I um, let it, uh, I, I pressed it um, before, pressed all the juice off before it got completely dry and let it finish off, off of the skins to help again, balance the tannin with the um, fruit that was there. So there you wow. go. That's the well, it's, wow. it's delicious. So um, yeah, well, nice yeah. Job. <laughs> bottom line, it's good. There you go. <laughs> and that's the only important relevant thing there. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so the wine business must be highly competitive. How do you cut through? I can already see how you cut through, but mm-hmm. how do you how do you manage the competition? Um, so um, I've been, been in business for twenty years now. Um, last year was my twentieth vintage, um, and um, this year will be my tenth vintage as the winemaker. Um, and I, I'm very fortunate that I have some really great distribution partners around the country. Um, and I think people have, have uh, come to understand that I deliver a pretty consistent product each year at a pretty decent price. So that's really helpful, um, is having a good product at a reasonable price and having had some history of being able to deliver that over a few vintages. Do yeah. you have really good relationships with your distributors? Do they end up Absolutely. becoming friends? Or? Yeah. They really do. I mean, because I work, I don't work with really big companies for the most part. I'm working with small companies like mine. Um, and I really, you know, I, my, but one of the things I enjoy about my distributors is good communication. We're able to help each other out, you know, during the um, pandemic, um, there's obviously there's been a lot of challenges mm-hmm. to work through. So if you've got good communication, you can attack those challenges together and hopefully help each other out. That small business owners have been really impacted by COVID. So what creative solutions have you implemented? Um, well, um, I, of course, panicked initially um, and reviewed my business plan probably four times in the first week. Then, then I just like, switched off for a little while and realized, okay, we're not going to do anything. I focused on my garden and my garden looks great now. Um, and then as things started to settle down, started to work out, okay, how can we, um, how can we pivot and uh, work, make the most out of this? Um, I've started to sell more directly to consumers. Um, I've started doing deliveries locally. Um, if people are, don't feel comfortable coming to the tasting room, I will go deliver wine to them as long as they, you know, buy like six bottles or something. I um, had some support that I was giving to uh, some restaurants to restaurants so that we could they could offer some of the Whirlpool wines by the glass. Um, and I've switched that more to retail since so, so many of the restaurants are closed. Mm. Um, and then trying to work with any restaurants that are offering um, takeout. I mean, it's the restaurants I feel like, so my heart goes out to because oh. they're oh. just stuck between a rock and a hard place. They are. Um, they don't have many options open to them. No. Unless the weather's good and you can put people outside. Yeah, and even oh, yeah. that's challenging. Oh, yeah. Well, I love going out to restaurants. Oh, I didn't realize me how too. much. I'm so tired of cooking. I am so tired of cooking. We've been doing a little more takeout. We did not the first 60 days. We did everything cooking in. How about you? I um, have been trying to support some of the restaurants that have been supportive of me. So I was trying to get takeout um, at least, you know, once, twice a week. Um, And then cooking a lot too. Um, But there's just something so lovely about sitting around a table with friends, right? I know. Yes. And just going out into different space, not just your own space. I mean, it's lovely to have your family or people around, but I think just to go someplace else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've all been, you know. That's my favorite pastime. (laughs) Jerry and I, uh, two favorite pastimes, coffee houses, coffee houses. And if I'm with Julie, it's always a wine bar. Uh, Julie, we call it girls camp. Oh <laughs> my gosh, we love girls camp. We just go to the bar, we have our wine. It's just so fabulous. And more um, wine. Yeah, and dinner, going out to dinner. Dinner. It's just yeah. fantastic. It's, yeah. Yeah, and food you wouldn't make at home, right? So No, no. I like being surprised by, my, by the food, you know, just because you cook something, you can, and, you know, it's no surprise. It's lovely to have somebody bring you food that you can explore. Mm, that's a good point. Oh, yes. And I've taken home many recipes from a restaurant. You know, uh-huh. right. I've, I've never yeah, asked yeah. the chef, but I've said, oh, I like this combination. I'm going to try to recreate it at home. Mine yeah. don't quite turn out the same, but <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm getting better. COVID has created uh, more attention to detail on the cooking side of things. How does the wine club work? Uh, how does the offerings and tell us a little bit about that? So the wine club, um, I ship usually just twice a year, um, I just new releases. So whatever new wines I have. So it's usually two to three wines in the spring and then again in the fall. And um, uh, any wine club members that get free tastings in the tasting room, which we just opened like yesterday. 
um, and then uh, and uh, and they get a discount off the wines as well. Um, and there's some wines, you know, that I've like I'll own, so there's a couple of wines just recently where I bottled one barrel's worth, 23 cases. So wine club members get priority access um, to those. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And you ship. I do. Yeah. You ship. I ship okay. um, to most states. There's some states that are illegal. Um, like and Utah? Where, yeah, Utah is one of them. <laughs> oh. Yeah. I guess that would be a problem, right? Uh -huh. So you've been producing, like you said, for 20 years. Now you're over 40. I am. I'm a lot over 40. <laughs> you are all woman and you are over 40. Well, Pam, we have, is your birthday the 24th or 25th? 24th. I know okay. you're really close to me, right? Yeah, I'm the 25th. Oh, I remember God, that because there were a cancer. couple times. Yes, yeah. we're both cancers. I love cancers. <laughs> they're my favorite. I decided they're my astrological favorite sign. Okay, so what's changed in the way you approach your work? Um, well, so I, I turned 52 um, last month. Um, and for sure, uh, so I, and I just set up my own production space, finally, after 20 years in the wine business. One of the things I did do is get myself an electric pallet jack. Um, I don't mind doing punch downs myself. Punch downs, you have to get up on the fermenters and then you kind of push all the, uh, you have this metal tool and push all of the grape skins down into the juice and you do that twice a day. And I'm perfectly fine doing those. It's actually a really good, like all body cool workout. Um, but uh, picking up a, uh, a one and a half ton um, fermenter full of grapes with a regular pallet jack, I just thought, you know, I don't think I want to do that anymore. So I got myself an electric pallet jack for harvest. Yep. I'd love to see what that looks like. Well, maybe I can show you. I can. Make, okay. Take us, take us on a little here. tour. Okay. I'll, I'll take you on a little tour. With okay. Me, That'd be fun. Lots of wine. Yeah. And then there's nothing in here right now because uh, all my barrels are down in Eugene. Um, so I don't have anything. Um, so you'll here. be bringing your barrels up there though. But here. Oh my gosh. Look oh. at that space. Oh my it's God, that's fantastic. fantastic. That, it? And so that is where all of my barrels and fermenters are going to go. Fermenters first, obviously. And then once all the grapes are, uh, you know, squ squished and dry, then they go into a barrel. So first off, we go here. This is the door. <laughs> grapes come in. The grapes come in and then they go um, here onto this uh, conveyor. And this is going to be lifted up. This is going to be about 84 inches um, high so that it can go into that hopper at the end of the destemmer there. Oh, so um, grapes come um, tip down onto the conveyor and we stand here or with it, like masks, of course, or, you know, um, face shields is probably what we're going to do. Sort through all of the grapes. I, um, I mimic the vineyards myself as well. So uh, when we pick the grapes, I'm out there, you know, like sorting through stuff in the vineyard. And then we'll start again when we get to the winery um, with good music on because that's really, really important. <laughs> Um, and then our grapes go into here and then uh, we destem them. So um, here, um, okay. goes into the destemmer. Um, then the uh, berries get taken off of the, uh, uh, what's called the rachis, the stems, or not. Sometimes I'll do whole cluster fermentation. Um, they go it down, they dip down, drop, drop down here into a fermenter. And then they just kind of sit there until we have wine. When we have wine, we go to, my dinky, dinky, dinky little press. It's about the size of a couch. Oh, it's um, so cute. It is so cute. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's lovely. A cutie, cutie little press. So, I love um, it has the little grapes on the side is on the logo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Europress. It's really gentle. I like, really like Europress. So um, the grapes go in there. When, um, the, so we'll drain off the juice. We'll drain, drain off all of the wine. Um, as much as we can, and then the bit that's left over, the um, pumice that's left over, we'll, uh, we'll throw in there, or the must, or whatever, we'll throw it in there. And then um, it'll squish off the, we'll squish it so we can get the last bit of the uh, wine out. And, um, and then it goes, settles off for a day or two, and then goes into barrel. Oh. So that's where I can kind of uh, wheel that around um, and get on, do all my analysis and everything during harvest. Are you tasting as you're processing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, um, I mean, uh, I'm tasting at certain points. Mostly, I don't taste a whole, I mean, sure, during harvest, I'll be tasting um, just to kind of like check how things are going. Um, so yeah, I taste. I mean, it's very is different it, tasting juice is tasting wine. 
Is it swirl and spit or is no, it swirl? No, no, no. It's not really. It's just kind of like I'm, pro I'm you know, probably getting samples into, uh, into a little plastic beaker um, and I'm spitting everything. No, the thing I drink most during harvest is beer. Oh, right. Okay. It takes a lot of beer to make good wine. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I like that. That's a good slogan. Mm -hmm. It's been used before, I have to say. Yeah, probably. Not it's the not first original. time. <laughs> you're a female entrepreneur you're a single mom like what challenges have you had to really deal with and what makes you who you are because willful really is you yeah that's is. where the name's from the name uh -huh. I um it is so well the whole story you know so um I was originally a business with me and my um ex-husband and then um we split up um, and I took over the winemaking then in 2011. We had our own vines planted at the time. And uh, I, I just, I'd been working my butt off in the vineyard and just couldn't envisage giving my grapes to somebody else to make the wine. And I'd, I'd been helping out with harvest every year. So I figured, well, you know, how hard can this be, right? You know, um, and so uh, I decided I was going to make the, wine, make the wine myself in 2011, um, and uh, I did get a lot of help. My ex-husband was really helpful. He gave me a lot of notes, um, certainly after a bunch of texts, um, you know, all the way through Harvest. I was at Laurel Ridge, Laurel Ridge Winery. Chris uh, Berg was the winemaker there, and he was super helpful in terms of answering questions and offering guidance. It's a really supportive environment. Um, in the Willamette Valley. So uh, yeah, that, I mean, that was a challenge. It wasn't necessarily unique to being female. It was just kind of a, just a challenging situation. Then uh, Aaron passed away unexpectedly in 2013. Um, and then I was left with two children and 17 acres. And I thought, well, yeah, I don't know that I want to do that. So it was an incredibly hard decision. Um, but it was the vineyard was not the um, was only about fifteen percent of the overall production. I decided to sell the uh, vineyard because I felt like I couldn't really be the mom that I wanted to be um, if I had that kind of property to manage. I didn't really feel that um, I was going to be able to do both, not with the limited resources that I felt we had as well. So now I buy all of my grapes, but I really enjoy going out to the vineyards and working through the summer with the um, vineyard owners. But I don't have to be doing a bunch of the work myself. The bulk of my work really is kind of more so when the kids are at school. It means that I don't have as much to do in the summer. Um, the workload's pretty light and that's super helpful. Uh, having my own business actually I think is a huge asset as a um, single parent because uh, it gives me a lot of flexibility. I can work on my terms. So that's been hugely helpful. How old are your boys now? Uh, my boys are 17 and 14. So I'm like the stupidest person in the world right now. <laughs> oh my God. I'm so stupid. That's crazy to think that that's <laughs> yeah. their age, but it is a tough age. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a tough or, Do they ever help you? Do they ever uh, help you? Yeah, I have I have photographic evidence of it. Um, <laughs> they uh, uh, um, they've helped. You know, they did some capsuling ones. Samson helped me top barrels. He has helped me top barrels before. Um, although I remember sometime I think he was like twelve, um, <laughs> and uh, and I and he was starting to look kind of like a little kind of drowsy, and I realized he was drinking the topping wine. Oh, but he <laughs> slept okay, great that, that night. He uh, probably uh, slept great. Like, no. <laughs> That's a big no-no. I'm glad you like it, but no. <laughs> yeah. Now he's 17 and he hates wine. How do you relax and how do you self-care? So I moved into a new house um, just recently um, and there's a little deck um, off of my bedroom. So I put my yoga mat out there. So um, in the, when it's nice in the mornings um, and when I remember, I go out and do some yoga to start the day off out there. Exercise, um, I meditate once in a while, but probably only once or twice a week, but I feel way better when I do. Oh my God, and that's my kind of happy place. So when, you know, the day hasn't gone so well and um, I'll just go out into my garden. I got, I'm growing vegetables. The simple things, you know, when I, when I used to have the vineyard, one of my favorite things to do would be up early and get a cup of tea and then be up in the vineyard at six o'clock in the morning working in the vineyard. And um, it's peaceful and it's cool and, and, you know, when it's warm in the summer. So that's just a lovely way to start the day. Well, you're really present yeah. too. You're not distracted by other things. You really are in that space. Yep. In the other day that you were in, uh, is it Perry? You're in perimenopause. How are you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
What are you doing for that? There's a lot of hormones in our household. <laughs> <laughs> Teenagers and menopause. Oh and so, much. so great. Oh. I have a herbal supplement that I, um, that is my uh, Save the Kids um, supplement. Yeah. <laughs> it stops me from killing them. <laughs> uh, primrose. Primrose has been great. It's got oh. primrose oil in it and it has uh, something else as well. Yeah. That and then ginkgo because of course I forget everything. Yeah, I've been running a bunch actually. Um, my uh, very wonderful boyfriend, um, Rod, um, got me, he was at a charity event and um, got me the gift of free entrance to all of the Y racing events. Um, so Sherry McMillan um, is a, um, female, um, a female owner, operator of a uh, um, Northwest personal training in Vancouver down to, um, in um, Southern state of Washington, Southern part of Washington state. She also puts on these events. And they are usually um, in-person events this year. Of course, they're all virtual events. And so I figured, well, okay, I'm, I'm just going to do all 12 of them um, or 11 of them. And uh, so I did. I have done so far. I did my first half marathon um, in May. Fantastic. And um, Fantastic. Uh, I got my knee injured. So um, my 17-mile run ended up being a 5K, which I feel kind of ashamed about, but you know, whatever. There is no um, shame. There is no shame. <laughs> Hopefully I'll at least get a triathlon in there at some point. Yeah, I actually, yeah. I think that's probably my favorite event is um, because it, it's a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. The one that Bikes, I lived there before. Run. Yeah. And you mm -hmm. know, running, but I'm swimming outside in the Columbia um, at the end of the summer is actually really lovely. Yeah. It's, it's, it's great. I mean, it's, I don't know. I haven't done a triathlon yet. I think it's going to be a little hard to do that virtually, but I am certainly game to try it and we'll need to at some point before the end of the summer. And you play tennis. Playing tennis, I used to play more with the kid, more of tennis. Now I'm playing tennis with the kids. I was trying to stay connected as a family, um, mm. which I think is really, it's harder as they get to be teenagers, particularly mm -hmm. I think with boys. So um, we just started playing tennis with the kids. We Good. are all pretty much as, as, as um, lousy as each other. So it works <laughs> great. <laughs> and you're golfing as well. And I just started golf lessons. Yeah. So see willful in the background. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It, it really speaks to who you are. You, yeah. You're an inspiration, Pam. You truly are. Anybody that uh, tunes into this are going to be inspired by your energy. Mm -hmm. so. uh, I, just, I feel like you just do what you have to, right? Yeah, you do. You don't even question it. You just go do it. You go for it. One thing I really want to do when I'm not quite as, you know, when I'm not quite as involved with the kids and, um, and have a little bit more free time, I really want to be a CASA. I think. Say that again. Court, court is a CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocate. Oh, um, yes. And they um, help uh, children that are in the foster, um, it, that have gone into the, into the care system, basically, and trying to work with the court system, trying to work with their families, um, trying to move the process along. I mean, so as a producer, right? I mean, you're, mm -hmm. it, it's, a, it's the perfect skill set. You know, you're yeah, used to is. sort of taking a problem and cutting through the crap and try to get things done. Yeah. So, well, it's um, interesting. My, and this is a whole other subject, but my niece is a lawyer for that system. And then my sister-in-law worked as a social worker uh -huh. within that system. That help is needed. I guess the, their, their role is really a support to the child. And then also mm -hmm. as a communicator to just Advocate. help facilitate things, moving things along. Because, you know, I mean... People don't always have the same degree of urgency at the, at the time that the child's growing and yeah. missing out on some oh. really key parts of life while, you know, yeah. the system is kind of going along at its own pace. So, right. Yeah. I like the and idea it's of It's overloaded. Challenge. It's an yeah, overloaded Yeah, completely system. overloaded. Yeah, unfortunately. So the other thing we want to hear about is you just had a big event mm -hmm. on Friday. So tell us about that. I mean, this is really so exciting. <clears throat> Yeah. So like I said, I've been in this business now for 20 years. You know, it wasn't, it was not necessarily my dream to be a winemaker. It's taken me some time to fully embrace that as my dream. Um, I really do enjoy it. I, I enjoy doing it a lot. I love working with my hands. I love working with uh, the vineyards. I've been looking for a place for like three years um, to make my own wine in. Um, I've been kind of reluctant to put down roots and finally did at the beginning of this year, just before the um, COVID hit, I uh, took on a lease at a, um, just a small place in uh, North Portland. And um, so I've got 2,500 square feet. I'm going to be making the wine here 
and um, I've got a little tasting room here. I'm looking forward to welcoming people Saturday. Yesterday we opened for the first time um, to the public. And we're doing everything by um, reservation so that we don't, uh, so that we can pace people arrive, you know, that when they arrive, um, so that we can offer people a good experience, but also do it in a very, in a healthy, um, socially distanced, safe way. Um, cause I certainly don't want to be, con- I want to be able to host people. I want to be able to, you know, have my business open, but I really do not want to be one of the people to contribute to the spread of COVID. In any no, way. and I'm sure you want to so, spend time with yeah. people too, in a way mm-hmm. that's safe. And so they make a reservation, they go on your site, go on the website, we click post. a button. Yeah. It's just willfulwine.com. Go on the website. You can order wine there. If you're not local, you can order wine um, on the website. Just click on the homepage. There's a button to press if you want to be able to uh, sign up to the, for, to the reservation system. And we're open Fridays from two to seven and Saturdays from uh, 12 till five. Okay. Did you have a pretty good turnout yesterday? Uh, yes. I mean, we hadn't advertised it at all. So we had, we definitely had a few people and we were still kind of working through some of the um, processes, um, but we did have people here and we put um, uh, chairs and tables outside because um, it's a beautiful sunny day. So um, I think the interesting thing is going to be um, September, October when we are making wine here as well, but we'll put a, we're going to put barriers up so we can make sure that people can view what we're doing. Um, mm-hmm. because they're going to be, you know, close, but they can still be safe. Right. Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that. That's right. So, well, that's fantastic. I'm sure it's been We're, a long process and you're there. I mean, you have your tasting room now. You know, the oh, sign behind me yeah. that went up on Monday when he was putting it up, I almost like shed a tear because uh, of course you did. It was an emotional moment. <laughs> Oh, well, maybe I was just freaking out about committing to, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. It's so well-deserved because we, Sharon and I know you from way back Mm -hmm. and you've always been this person. So it doesn't matter what you decide to do. You will give it, you you are willful. You will give it your all. So that's a lovely thing to say. Thank you. You are, you are. Okay, so we're going to wrap this up, I guess. We don't want to go, but we have had fun drinking wine with you and learning about wine, Pam, and we wish you the very best. I don't have any more wine. Look at me. I drink all my wine. Woo, I'm a lush. Just thank you so much for asking me. This has been really fun. It's been lovely to connect with you guys. It's been just delightful. Well, thank you. And I'm going to find you because we're in the same area now. So, yeah. Yeah. Come visit. <laughs> I will come visit. Okay. Thank <laughs> you for you, Pam. being part of the show. Love you I- too. And <laughs> thank you. We are going to end our show with an affirmation. In fact, I found it. I got so excited and I was like, oh, this is perfect and appropriate, appropriate for willful. Whatever is simple must be bold. We what hope- does that mean? Well, I think that uh, you put me on the spot. Here. I know I am putting. Me. Um, well, to me, I think simple means it's always so hard to get to the simple. So mm. it means really what willful means. It means determination, pertinacious, being unruly and a little wild. But mm-hmm. maybe all uh, putting it all together under an, the umbrella of grace. Uh, I think you can't achieve your goals unless you have courage because it isn't an easy ride and as you can see it's never easy no as you can see from even our our conversation with pam Mm -hmm. she's had tough going at it but she never ever stopped and just like what you said which i think is really important she has always pam always does things with grace yeah, she does. And I think that you really, that really comes through, don't you think, in this mm-hmm. conversation we have? Yeah. Okay. So be safe, stay well. And until the next yes. episode, cheers. Post you. Cheers, dear friend. Bit. Cheers. I have a little you. bit too. Okay.